You come to the 31st verse of the, we come to the 31st verse of uh, 10th chapter of Hebrews. We will go on from verse 32. And I want to go back to the primary reason why this book was written. Written to Judaic believers who had uh, first accepted Christ and thereafter had faced a lot of difficulties and they really were strong in the Lord. But over a period of time, their zeal for God had reduced. By the time this letter was written, they were supposed to be teachers of God's word, but they could not take in solid food. They were still living on milk because they were overwhelmed, intimidated by the circumstances, difficulties they faced. Initially, they faced a lot of difficulties. Later on, they became lukewarm. And the writer of this book is exhorting them to understand they come to believe in Jesus, who is far greater than all the prophets, far above the angels, far above Moses, far above the priests, you are the perfect high priest, just to remind them who they have come to believe in. And now he's getting the crux of the matter, how they need to persevere. And he begins in the 32nd verse by saying, I'll read that verse to you. Hebrews chapter uh, 10, verse 32. Remember those earlier days after you received the light, when you endured in a great conflict of suffering. Remember those days when you came to believe in Christ, when you understood the light, how you faced difficulties, you endured the great test of suffering. And you wonder, after all, Christ himself was a Jew. He came to the Jews. And how come these Jews are treating their fellow Jews who believe in Jesus so badly? You understand persecution from people who don't have nothing to do with God. But these people are given the oracles of God, the Jews. And yet, they persecute all those people who believe that Jesus is the Messiah. The Lord Jesus Christ actually told the apostles, the 13th to 17th chapter of John records the incidents that happened and the Lord's teachings to the apostles the last one week of his physical life on this earth. In John chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, he says, I've told you this, that you will not fall away. What did he say? Teachings again. Don't fall away. And then he says about the leaders, Jewish leaders, they'll put you out of synagogues. There'll be a time when those who kill you will think they're doing a favor to God. We may think about Saul. Saul thought doing a favor to God by persecuting Jews. Uh, sorry, persecuting Christians. So Jesus spoke about that. He prophesied. Don't fall away. I've told you this, that you will not fall away. You follow my teaching, but don't fall away. And time will come to put out synagogue. And then that's what happened. Now, if you look at 9th chapter of John, verses 19 to 22, read about this blind man's parents were questioned by the Pharisees. Is this your son? This blind man was healed. He was born blind from birth. And after his healing, miraculous healing, they asked the parents, is this your son? Is this the one they say was born blind? Then how come he's healed? Who healed him? Parents knew who healed uh, their son. But they say, you ask him, he's of age. You ask him. He is our son. We know he's born blind. But who healed him? We don't know. They say, we don't even know. Why do they say that? That's because... They were afraid to put out the synagogue. The Jewish leaders had decided anyone who believed that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. They decided all the Jewish leaders. So the parents of the blind man, instead of rejoicing over the fact the son is healed, they even say, we don't even know who he will. You ask him, he'll tell you. And they knew that if they say that he is Jesus healed them, they put out synagogue. Synagogue was a very prominent uh, uh, sort of security for the Jews. Every town had a synagogue in the middle. And that's where they used to meet, not only for teaching of God's word, they used to meet for very social functions, weddings, engagements, functions. They used to meet. It's basically a social place, a place for social gathering. And being put out of synagogue means you're out of the mainstream of Jewish life. And nobody liked that. 
So the blind man's parents, we don't know who healed him. You ask him, he's a wedge. They're scared of the Jewish leaders. Who decided that anyone who believes Jesus is Messiah will put out the synagogue. Very interestingly, some of the Jewish leaders themselves have become believers. In John chapter 12, 42, 43, it says many Jewish leaders had become believers. But because the Pharisees did not know their faith. For they loved praise from men more than praise from God. Very interesting. John 12, 40, check it out later on, 42, 43. Many of the leaders who had decided that who have believed in Jesus had the Messiah be born of synagogue, they were believers themselves, but did not acknowledge their faith. Because they love praise from men more than praise from God. They are afraid of the Pharisees. One among them, Jewish leader, was a man by name Joseph of Arimathea. Very familiar name, isn't it? All the four gospel writers talk about Joseph of Arimathea. In John 19, 38, John says, he was a disciple, he was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, because he feared the Jewish leaders. Very interesting, no? He was a believer, disciple, but secretly, because he feared the Jews. Jewish leaders. He himself was a leader. In fact, Mark writes in Mark 15, 43, he was a prominent member of the Jewish ruling council. Prominent member. Ruling council is the Sanhedrin, the highest authority in Judaism. The Jewish ruling council, the council was decided all the matters concerning the administration of the, of the faith. He was a prominent member of the Jewish ruling council. Then you'll find in the uh, Gospel of uh, Matthew, 27 chapter, verse 57, it says, he was a rich man and a disciple. A rich man and a disciple. Then Luke writes, Luke, 20 chapter is 43, uh, sorry, 15, uh, 20 chapter was 15, 51, that uh, you may wonder, see, he was a Jewish leader, a believer, secret believer, prominent member of the council, what was he doing when the council decided to crucify Jesus, hand him out to Pontius Pilate? What is the council doing? He was a member of the council, prominent member of the ruling council, but in all fairness to him, it says, he did not, he did not agree with the decision. He didn't agree. Majority felt he should, this should be handed out to Pilate for, uh, uh, for a trial. But Joseph of Arimathea, believer, rich man, prominent member, secret believer, didn't agree to the decision. So all the four gospel writers speak, speak about Joseph of Arimathea. Now, this is a lesson for all of us, that we should never condemn people in the faith who are secret believers. How often do you find Christians judging others? Oh, he's a believer. Why can't he say he's a believer? Why can't he go and share the gospel? Why is he secret? How can he be a secret believer? Joseph was a secret believer. And God used Joseph Armathia to fulfill prophecy. Because Isaiah 53 chapter was 9. Isaiah 53 9 talks about in his death he'd be numbered with the rich people along in his death. And he was actually put in a tomb that belonged to Joseph Armathia. So we understand such a wonderful man. He was an upright man. Believer, prominent member, secret believer, but afraid of the Jewish leaders. He's also afraid. He should not be afraid, but he was afraid. And uh, he fulfilled prophecy. Or God used him to fulfill prophecy. So the fact is that the Jews, when they became believers, many of them were secret believers. Leaders were believers. Joseph was a leader. There's one aspect. The other aspect is, even the family members who reject. In Matthew chapter 10, from verse 34, we read, Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace, I come with a soul. I have come to turn a father against a son, daughter against a mother, 
doctrine of against the modern law, a man's enemies will be members of his own household. What he means here is that the sword that he brings is not to kill or injure, but to divide. I have not come to bring peace. Peace means oneness. I have come to divide. Till anyone in the family believes in me, there will be unity in the family, oneness, close-knit family. And most Jewish families are very, very close-knit. That's the descendants of all Abraham. The Ishmael descendants or Isaac descendants, you notice today also, they're very close-knit. They're clannish, stick to each other. Families also. Large families they have, they stick together. But then one member of the family turns to Jesus as the Messiah, he's thrown out. Out of the synagogue, also from family. That's a reality. So that's a background. I'm explaining the background to you. How these people here, Jews, Initially, they were full of joy. Then by the time this letter was written, because of persistent persecution and difficulties, they slowly lost their zeal for the law. And the writer writing them to encourage them to bring them back to a close walk with God. Let's see what they faced. Verse 33. Sometimes were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. Other times, they stood side by side with those who are so treated. He talked about specifically what they all faced. That you are publicly exposed to insult and persecution. From whom? From fellow Jews. Other times, you stood side by side. Moral support for those who are so treated. Verse 34. You suffer along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. Because you knew that you still had better and lasting positions. He specifically talked about what all they faced. They joyfully accepted the confiscation of their properties. The word confiscation here is from a Greek word called arpagan. A-R-P-A-G-N, arpagan. Arpagan means plundering, plundering. Not just confiscation, plundering. When a person becomes a believer in Jesus, his house and wealth will be plundered, just simply taken in by the authorities. But these people joyfully accepted that, for they knew they had better and lasting possessions. Doesn't matter if my house is gone, it's plundered by these Jewish authorities. I have lasting possessions in heaven. In this context, you'll find. One point of time when the Lord told the disciples, it's easier for a camel to go to the eye of needle and the rich man to go to heaven. The disciples, the apostles say, who then can be saved? If rich people can't go to heaven, who will be saved? Because there are a lot of rich people around them. Even Joseph Armite was a rich man. Let's not forget that. So the disciples have this question, disciples. If it's so difficult for a rich man to go to heaven, then who then will be saved? Then Jesus says, verse 26, Matthew 19, 26, with man is not possible, with God all things are possible. Meaning, with God, even a rich man can go to heaven. Because today we go to heaven not because we're rich or poor, but because we believe in Jesus. Rich man can believe in Jesus. Joseph was a rich man and a believer, secret believer, disciple. So disciples, uh, the apostles have this question. So many rich people are there. So how then who then will be saved? With God, nothing is impossible. Then they think about themselves. Suddenly they realized that uh, we left everything to follow you. Peter, in fact, says, Matthew 19, 27. We left everything to follow you. What is there for us? Now, interestingly, the rich man can go to heaven, Jesus said, because we got nothing is possible. Apparently, Peter was not that rich. But what about us? Whatever he had, we left everything to follow you. He left his fishing nets. Of course, he went back to fishing later on and got brought him back. We left everything to follow you. What is there for us? 
Look at the amazing statement Jesus makes. 29 verse. Matthew 19, 29. The latter part, he says, no one has left houses, houses, father and mother, brothers and sisters, wife and children, fields. No one will not receive hundred times worth of loss. Hundredfold they will get. God is a just God. When they the think we lose something for the sake of the Lord, we'll never be the losers. In following the Lord, we are never losers, always gainers. Temporarily may lose in this world, but they have great rewards in heaven. And therefore, it's very, very clear. These people, when their the property were plundered by the authorities, are pagan, plundered, not just confiscated. They're joyfully accepted, joyfully accepted, not just accepting as resignation. Joyfully, for they knew they had better and lasting possessions in heaven. It's better to suffer for some time in this world, short time, however many years it is, when those sufferings are going to create for us eternal glory in heaven, which is permanent. Troubles here are light and momentary. Rewards are permanent forever, for eternally in heaven. So better to you know, be a people who are not just not short-sighted, not just not long-sighted, but eternally sighted. We shouldn't be short-sighted, not even long-sighted, but eternity sighted. Look at things of eternal life. So these people, when they began their walk with the Lord, they were so full of faith. But by this time, the letter was written, they had become a little bit lukewarm. They're supposed to be teachers of God's word. But they needed the elementary teachings all over again. So the letter was written to them to basically uh, motivate them, stimulate them to a close walk with God. Verse 35. So, do not throw away your confidence. You are richly rewarded. Don't throw away your confidence. You were confident once, but now you have become a little lukewarm. Keep on with your confidence. You will be richly rewarded. The time for everything. In time, God will work out everything. Ecclesiastes 3.11. He makes everything beautiful in his time. In this context, look at one more verse in the Bible. Romans chapter 12, 11 and 12. Romans 12, 11 and 12. It's written to Christians as well as to these people in this context. They never got the letter from Romans, but then you can learn from all these amazing writings in the Bible. These two verses say, never be lacking in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. These people have lost that fervor. They didn't have the same zeal they had when they first became believers. But then, exhortation is, never be lacking zeal. Keep a spiritual fervor. Some Bibles say, some Bibles, be a glow in the spirit. A glow on fire. Be on fire. Be a glow in the spirit. Next verse says, 12th verse, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Be joyful in hope. Let's go back to this verse. Don't throw away confidence. You'll be richly rewarded. Hope is the reward in heaven. Here we are suffering. But in heaven, great rewards are in store for us. Verse 36. You need to persevere. You need to persevere. So that when you've done the will of God, you'll receive what has been promised, what he has promised. You need to persevere. The word perseverance here, the persevere here, is the word called upomonas in Greek. U-P-O-M-O-N-E-S, upomonas. It means endure. Endure. Endurance and persistence both mean the same. And we endure by the hope that we have got in Jesus. And hope never fades away in him. When you put in hope in him, you will always be rewarded. So he says here, you need to persevere. So when you done the will of God, will means telma. Telma means wish or desire. God wishes, he desires that you go through trials, you need to persevere. Once you persevere, you receive what he has promised. And to appropriate promise of God, any promise God gives us, 
How do you appropriate that? Two things. Faith and patience. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 12 says, Don't be lazy or lethargic or sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promise of God. When you have faith and then you don't have patience, sometimes the faith gets affected. That's what happened to these people. Initially, a lot of faith. They joyfully accept the configuration of the properties. But then they're patient for some time. Slowly, the patience began to wear away and the faith got affected. Faith and patience, we inherit the promise of God. So one day in heaven, we'll have all our rewards. May not happen in the world itself. Sometimes God rewards us here itself. But surely, when you give something for him in this world, we'll definitely have rewards in heaven simply because God is just. Therefore, let's go on. Verse 37. In just a little while, he who comes will come and will not delay. This is the first, second coming, not the first coming. Of course, the reference of the Old Testament is for the first coming. Because that he did not yet come when the original reference was given in the Bible. What is the reference actually? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3. Oh, sorry, Habakkuk 2, 3. Isaiah 26 chapter, verse 20. Just coming, referring first coming. In our context today, second coming. He's surely going to come. Little while, he who is coming, will come, will not delay. We think he's delaying. He's not delaying. For us, there's a delay. For him, it's on perfect timing. That's why in 2 Peter, third chapter, verse 8, Peter writes, with God, one day, like thousand years, thousand years, like one day. Verse 9. God is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. You don't understand slowness. Some understand it as delaying. He's not delaying. He'll come on time. According to his perfect time, he will come. So we have to hold on to the confidence they have. He will not delay. In the meantime, what do we do? Verse 38. But, but it is one, we live by faith. Till he comes, we live by faith. We very when he comes, we will give us rewards. He will give us what he has promised. He will repay us for all the troubles we face in this world. But till that time, we live by faith. And this is a reference from the Old Testament and also New Testament. Romans 1.17, Paul writes, the righteous shall live by faith. And he's quoting from Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. So here the writer is quoting from Romans 1 15, same thing. You may not have had Romans 1 17 then, whatever it is. But the basic reference point is Habakkuk 2 4. The just shall live by faith. Righteous shall live by faith. So till he comes the second time, he's not delaying, he's coming on time. We think he's delaying. Why, Lord, why have not come, Lord? He'll surely come. In his time. And the time has fully come. Even the first coming, written about that by Paul, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of woman, born under the law, redeemed those under the law. Time had fully come for his first coming. Time has not yet come for second coming. He will come, surely. Till that time, we who are made righteous by his blood shall live by faith. Faith in his word, faith in his promises, which you hold on to, faith in his instruction, which we obey, faith in God's standards, by which we are called to live by. In that process, we will reign in life. Next part of verse 18. Sorry, verse 38, not 18, verse 38. I just think was covering it. <laughs> and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back, one who goes back. When a, when a person shrinks back, God won't reject that person. He'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us. 
Very often I quote this verse in our meetings, 2 Timothy 2.13. Even though we are faithless, he remains faithful. For he cannot disown himself. He may be faithless, but he's faithful. But when we are faithless, he's not pleased. He won't reject us, never throws away. In John 10, 27, Jesus says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. They will never perish. We will never perish. We are secure in his hands. But if we shrink back, God is not pleased. We are going to please God in everything that we do. So that's what he's saying here. If we shrink back, God will be pleased. Look at verse 39. But you don't belong to those who shrink back. We do not belong to those who shrink back. They are different. He's encouraging that. And he says, we, who wrote the letter, we don't know who wrote the letter. Some scholars say, uh, it was Paul, we don't know. But whoever wrote this letter was a Jewish believer, I suppose. And he says, we don't shrink back. You and me don't shrink back. He's saying, we don't belong to that category. We don't shrink back and are destroyed. Destroyed here is what called upper lion. A P O L E I A N. It means losing out. You won't lose out. Not the kind who can lose out. Send back and destroy. No. God won't destroy us. We'll never perish. Anyway, we don't belong to the category. Some people may shrink back, God will bring them back. In the meantime, what happens when you shrink back? You lose out. The poor Apollyon is more exhaustive and more correct than the word destroyed. You lose out on so many blessings when you don't walk with God, when you shrink back. But he says we're not like kind, that kind, we will shrink back. Rather, what does he say? But those who have who are faith and are saved, we won't shrink back. They are those who have faith and are saved. Salvation is by faith. Christian life is by faith, faith in what God has spoken. And the good news for us is, if you think you lack faith or we might lose faith sometimes, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Hebrews 12, 2. And he ensured that you will not continue in sin. 1 John 3, 9. He will ensure our faith is secure. So actually our faith for our faith to be preserved, is putting trust in his faithfulness to keep our faith. Let me repeat the statement. It may be a little confusing. Our faith to keep our faith secure is trusting in the God of faithfulness to keep our faith. Everything is from him. Every good thing we have is from him, including faith. So we belong to people who through faith are saved. We won't shrink back. We might backslide a little bit. We might drift away a little bit, but he brings us back because he is faithful. God is faithful. God bless each one of us. With that note, the lesson for us, takeaway is, don't condemn people who are secret believers. <laughs> You're condemning Joseph of Arimathea. Let the people respond to God the way they want to respond. God will bring them back to him in his own way. God bless you all.